So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it has been an amazing day here in Dubai, which is uh, no wonder some of the brightest people on the planet are here with us today and in the next two days. And uh, we are going to uh, speak today about value-driven organizations. According to ChatGPT, and I believe you've heard this word on this conference a hundred times so far, but according to ChatGPT, value-driven organization is the one that values its customers and stakeholders above all. So two things we have here. We have a customer which has become the center of our galaxy. And then the products and services are only circulating around, gravitating around that. It's not the other way around, like it used to be in the past. And then we have the technology, which is a tool to challenge the status quo and to make the services more uh, better for the customer. So we will start for the, from the value-driven organization, and I don't know where we are going to end, because <laughs> I have extraordinary uh, people here on the panel. We have uh, here His Excellency, Uvi Madiev, and he is the chairman of the state a um, agency for public institutions and uh, uh, social innovations of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And he is the mastermind um, of the Asan centers, which are basically redefining or taking the public service notion on the next level. Uh, we have uh, Sophie here, Sophie Hackford. She is a global, and if I can add, um, fantastic woman, tech, futurist. So, uh, and of course, I have here Thomas Anglero, and um, besides many titles and positions he, he has, the one I like the most is a digital disruptor. So uh, I will start with Thomas. Please tell me, what is harder to disrupt? Is it a government or a corporation? Because you have been working both for governments and, and, and different uh, corporations. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you've had a wonderful day. And I'm sorry we're the last ones to speak, but we hopefully will entertain you and enlighten you. So I know your pain. Um, it's an interesting question. So I've worked as the head of innovation for in the public sector for five years with an innovation group. And the word innovation and public sector are two very strange words that usually don't go together. And I'm now the head of innovation for all the Nordic countries for Cognizant, uh, which is private sector. The, the answer to the question of which is more difficult to disrupt, a corporation or a government, the answer to that would be a corporation. But yeah. let me explain yeah. why. A government, and I have, to, I have to filter my stories because after five years of fighting for innovation inside the public sector, I could talk for weeks about how frustrating it is to innovate inside of the public sector. But a government is like a multi-headed dragon. You know the expression, if there's a three-headed dragon, if you chop off one head, you still have to battle the other two. The public sector has 10,000 heads. <laughs> so if you chop off one head, one leader, you still have to deal with the other 9,999 heads. It is very complex. It is not a entity, and it doesn't have one purpose. There are many purposes. A corporation in the private sector is Typically, main purpose is to make money. And it has one business model. And so you can disrupt that one head. Public sector, government's much more complicated. Um, but then there's a question of, do they need disruption? Both of them need to be disrupted. But you have to be extremely careful. And it's very different. It's, it's a long answer, but that's my short answer. Thank you so much. Sophie, do you have to add something on the governments and uh, private sector? Or you, you, you maybe, as a futurist, you, you can tell us more about why is that important? Why, why uh, disruption and technology matter for the government? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, 
Well, I think the only thing that is important when it comes to disruption is actually thinking about the future. And of course, I'm a futurist, so I'm horribly biased. Um, but I was, I've sort of become obsessed with this question I read the other day by a guy called Benjamin Bratton, who said, what future makes the past worth it? And that is a question I think we don't ask enough. What are we actually building towards? What do we actually want? Let's not sleepwalk into something that we don't. And that's something that I think we need to ask much more about. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Reed Hastings, who was the founder um, and CEO of Netflix, said that it could very easily have been a computer virus. And that instead of us all being uh, indoors watching Netflix, we would have been outdoors hanging out with our family and friends and no one would have watched Netflix and his, <laughs> you know, his stock price would have fallen off a cliff. Um, and of course, that is one of many big challenges that we face, whether it's climate change or cybersecurity, uh, whether it's pandemics, nuclear war, the whole lot. Um, and it's not just those that don't fit within very specific government departments, um, but it's also the solutions to those, whether it's fusion, whether it's uh, quantum computing, carbon sequestration. There are no specific government departments for those technology areas. Those are things that span everything. We all need to sit down and imagine what kind of future we're looking for. It's a creative exercise, which makes it sound like a luxury, but actually I would argue that it's completely the opposite, that we will sleepwalk into something we don't want unless we dream about the kind of world we do. Um, so this question, as I said, about what future makes the past worth it uh, is something we all need to ask, I think, um, uh, when we're thinking about disruption. Can, can I just comment yeah. on that? That was, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> A perfect example of sleepwalking into something we don't want is social media for our kids, right? When, when social media came out, when none of us, we all thought, oh, okay, the kid's on the phone, I'm sure it's safe and everything. But social media, the, the kids are exposed to everything. We just slept walk into that technology. Now every child in the world is affected by social media. But as a parent, I'm a parent, we thought it was okay. So I think your comment is excellent. And we have I'm, to be I'm very careful. I'm not on social media. I'm sorry? I'm not on social media for that reason. I haven't been for decades. But I'm, it, that, that's exactly right. Mm. Um, and that is one, as you said, example of you know, thousands and thousands of things. So we've got to spend a lot of time invested in that. Exactly. And you don't have to be a technologist. You can be just a caring parent. You know. Be, be ahead of the curve. If your kid says, hey, mama, papa, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this at school, take a moment, take some time, try to understand it. You know, don't be afraid of technology. It's getting easier and easier. You know how to open an app. You sh you're going to know how to use any technology for the next 50 years. It's just spend some more time. Like you said, don't walk into it. Yes, but you know, when you mention social media and all the Amazons of the world and that, kind of services pushed the citizens, pushed the government to kind of provide services which are similar to the ones that corporations are providing. And everything is online. Uh, social media is all, all over, uh, all around. So having in mind that, having in mind that basically government need to disrupt, to provide you know, social uh, public services that are very similar to what the corporates are providing. There is one thing uh, which is very interesting, uh, and I would like to uh, emphasize for Azerbaijan, for example. So in this world of, of artificial things, we have this artificial intelligence. We, we also have artificial meat, you know. There's one thing that you did well, and you preserves kind of the uh, Azerbaijan um, authenticity, that you still have physical spaces with real people on physical counters providing public services. So if you can tell us what is the importance of a physical space in the world that is becoming more and more digital. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's, an, uh, it's a pleasure and honor. Uh, to be part of today's discussion. And I would like to thank the government of the United Arab Emirates for their efforts organizing this summit. And uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Marta, uh, for your interesting question. You see, uh, 10 years ago, when our government established Assan Service Center, Assan Service Concept, uh, this question was in front of us. Uh, digitalization or physically to provide services by the principle of one uh, stop shop. <clears throat> uh, you see, uh, uh, I think uh, the first step 
of digitalization is standardization. <coughs> uh, uh, in our case, uh, when uh, uh, the president of the Republic of Azerbaijan established a sound service concept, established the state agency public, of the public service and social innovations, uh, our, uh, uh, we have two main directions. One of them, to provide all public service uh, by the principle of one-stop shop, and now uh, more than 300 uh, services we provided uh, in, the, in one place. By, by the base of uh, principles of transparency, effectiveness, accountability, uh, and etc. And uh, we, uh, our second uh, direction to research, or the research, uh, uh, high tech, modern technologies, high technologies, and innovations, how to implement in the field of public service. Uh, in that case, uh, first of all, uh, we create created uh, the basic unique uh, uh, standards for public service. Uh, because uh, first step is to, to optimize uh, the business process of service, then uh, automate this. Uh, you know, as you know, we, uh, if you uh, automate mess, you will get more mess. <laughs> uh, that's why uh, first step uh, to standardization, to optimize, uh, to optimize uh, uh, service process, uh, and uh, second step to uh, digitalize it. And uh, uh, our main goal is the uh, government and citizen relationship. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, see state, we cannot touch the state. We only can uh, feel state, but how and when? Uh, uh, then, uh, as citizen, I need service, public service. Uh, uh, I feel how my government uh, uh, care, uh, treat, treat me. Uh, uh, you, you see our buildings, our centers. Uh, uh, they are modern and a beautiful designer. Uh, why? Because it shows uh, the uh, power of uh, the state. Mm. And inside these buildings, we provide uh, services uh, as non bureaucracy transparency, uh, uh, for everyone uh, accessibility. Uh, it means the treatment of state for citizens. Power and uh, treatment is a two key uh, in our concept. Uh, second reason, I think. <coughs> uh, you see, uh, the governments uh, have a lot of resources to digitalize all services very quickly. But uh, is your citizen, is your society ready to use uh, digital services, to use high technologies? Uh, uh, do they have uh, digital skills? Uh, in our case, Asan Centers is, is a platform which uh, uh, we use technologies and innovations, and if we help the citizens uh, to use and to create or to develop their uh, digital skills uh, through the uh, get uh, the uh, services. <coughs> uh, and uh, third, I uh, I think uh, uh, digitalization is the most important key, most important tool for governments to uh, implement uh, their uh, uh, projects. But uh, new technologies, innovations, and digitalization take new challenges, new problems. Uh, I don't mean about uh, cybersecurity, it's, uh, it's the, you know. B but uh, some of invisible challenges. Mm -hmm. It's uh, asocial, asocialization, yeah. asocialization. Yeah. <clears throat> if we uh, digitalize all services, uh, we cut relationship between government and citizen. Okay, we 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 can't feel that, and uh, uh, in that in that case, Asan centers uh, is one of the platform to uh, uh, 
community, communication of society. And it's very important for governments. And uh, I think uh, every government uh, have to think about it, uh, which of level uh, they have to digitalize uh, their uh, strategy, their projects, and etc. Uh, and you know, I, uh, once I uh, uh, talk about it, uh, in our case, uh, our uh, old mothers, grandmothers, come to our centers and they choose uh, for their sons' brides. <laughs> you know, our, uh, uh, many of our uh, uh, employers are uh, um, women, <laughs> and they choose for their, it's the communication, new communication yeah. uh, for society. That's why I think uh, to provide services uh, by the physically uh, now and uh, the now is actu actual, actual. And uh, <clears throat> that's why I think uh, physical center uh, uh, not, uh, uh, is not alternative digitalization. Complementary. It's the, it's the first step, yes, first step mm. Mm. for digitalization. Thank you. thank you, thank you so much. Um, you have anecdotes, plenty of anecdotes yeah. happening in the, in the centers. Uh, but Thomas, uh, we've heard we have these physical spaces. Mm. On the other side of the spectrum, there are several governments that are moving their government services uh, on the metaverse. Mm. I know about Korean's government, the, they're moving Seoul as a um, you know, um, city of Seoul uh, to, to the metaverse. Mm. And uh, here in UAE, also I've seen the Ministry of Economy, some of the services, the Ministry of Healthcare. So do you think that these um, new virtual sp uh, spaces can assist the government to improve the way the government is engaging uh, with the citizens? The short answer is yes, but that's a dangerous answer just to take my answer of yes and run away with that. Because it's, it's Elaborate, not a, please. <laughs> it's not a simple yes. Um, I'm so impressed by your story. And I think the way, not I think, I know the way you've done it is the right way. And I'll elaborate. What we saw during COVID and the lockdown where everyone was forced to be digital, when we came out of that, do any of you, when you meet with people, do you see how people are a bit awkward now when you interact with people because they've been locked up for so long? Human beings must have inter-exchange. We must see each other. So your wonderful emphasis on having a place for people to go is correct today in 2023 and is correct probably in 2123. Mm -hmm. We must have physical spaces. Government must supply those physical spaces. The metaverse is coming and we cannot stop it because it's already here. There are tens of billions of dollars being spent every day and we, it's what you said before, don't just walk into it. That We already walked into it. <laughs> You're not gonna stop it. But even though we enter the metaverse, this virtual world where people interact and all that, we saw with COVID, which was a great test even though you're online all day, you feel like something's wrong. You're not getting enough out of life. You're missing something, and that's people. So I think what you're doing is beautiful. It's a wonderful example. Don't change <laughs> at all. Um, and if I could give you one more example, if we look back on the last 20, 30 years of the internet, and companies have done very well, there was a shoe company called Zappos. Mm -hmm. They obsess and you know, just want to buy shoes online, you do that. People would buy the shoes, come to an event like this, they have wonderful, very expensive shoes to show off to everybody. And as soon as the event went over, they would mail it back and Zappos had a policy where they would refund you the full amount of money. They were obsessed with customer service. They were obsessed with taking care of people. Taking care of people is always the best business model. It is always the one that is best. Investing in people, focusing on people, is always best. And governments, that's their job, obsess on that, and you will always do well, and your people will always love you. Do not move from where you're talking about. Even though everybody goes to the metaverse, they will come back down, and they're gonna wanna have social interaction. They're gonna wanna be with people. They wanna smile and see somebody smile back. 
So yes, the metaverse is huge, but love is bigger and stronger. This was very inspiring. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sophie, Sophie, is technology um, entrenching the inequality or we can see it as a positive engine of progress? Uh, well, yes. These are all questions that we need to ask and we need to ask them all the time and a lot. Um, <laughs> I mean, the number one thing that we're all thinking about at the moment, I think, is the sort of monopolistic behavior of big tech. And, and is it actually a solution of tech to solve the monopolistic uh, behavior of, of big tech? Uh, I like what Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the internet, uh, uh, how he describes uh, Web.3. Uh, so that's the mm -hmm. next one on from where we are today. Mm -hmm. He said the internet needs to earn our trust back. Uh, and I like that. Um, I think technology's got a long way uh, to go to earn our trust uh, trust back because I think we all feel and if we don't feel we probably should uh, that we are IP when we're mm. online when we're in the metaverse whatever that means we're actually someone else's intellectual property um, and that's a fairly uncomfortable feeling for me anyway um, and a lot of this sort of new tech frontier is promising and I bold and underlined promising that it's going to help uh, solve some of that stuff um, a friend of mine the other day said something quite fascinating, which has sort of troubled me ever since. He said that since 2020, uh, he's a tech person, uh, since 2020, a lot of the uh, information that we've been reading online has actually been already infiltrated by these AI platforms. Mm -hmm. He calls them AI isotopes uh, that are in <laughs> our... Uh, and he said, if we've been ingesting that as training data, like if all of us have been reading this training data for the last couple of years, this is going to end in a very strange way. And I, I like that. It made me, made me think quite profoundly about what these technologies are actually doing to us. And you talk about social media as a perfect example of that. Um, and I like uh, Pete Warden talks about how, how the governments and others should treat our data like toxic waste. They should treat it like the effluent from a nuclear power station or whatever it might be. It's very dangerous if it leaks. It's dangerous to the individual, but it's also dangerous to the company that does it. And that engineers should take a sort of responsibility for that engineer system to be leak proof in the same way that they, hopefully they do that in the nuclear uh, industry. Um, but you said at the, at the beginning also, there are plenty of positives that come out of this uh, as well. Um, whether it's using online metaverse type worlds to trial new forms of government, to trial new ways of doing things, to trial new services. Um, there's a tremendous potential for us to, to, to war game, for want of a better word, in virtual environments so we can test whether things work before they get released into the real world. So uh, I think the short answer, of course, is both. Um, but I think the most important thing to remember, certainly from a technologist's perspective, is that technology is not a force of nature. It's not like the weather where you can't do anything about it. You just got to let it come and hope <laughs> for the best. Like, it is something, you know, we still control the internet just about. Uh, uh -huh. Humans still design the internet. It's not something that's been taken away from us just yet. So uh, we've got to remember we have agency in all of this. And let's not recreate the problems that we have in the real world online. Um, let's not entrench that financial inequality. Let's not entrench a lot of these things that we have in the real world um, in our new virtual worlds. Yeah, you, yeah. You can, can I add some doom and gloom to her statement? No, please. <laughs> <laughs> so chat GPT, which we all probably uh, have heard way too much about, it's actually beginning to bother me because um, it's talking about it replacing search engines. And you're talking about uh, we still have control, right? Just about. J just, yeah. <laughs> Put your nails into the table, yeah, right? So two more days. Yeah. The, the, the thing that scares me with chat GPT is you ask a question, and it takes its time, and then it gives you an answer. Sort of like it's the definitive answer. When is life anything a definitive answer? <laughs> It's never a definitive answer. The beauty of the old search engine was you had the first link, second link, and you checked a few of them, and you decided on your own, maybe this one, maybe that one, little this one, little that one. ChatGB says, no, this is the answer. That's not life. That's not right. And then also, who's controlling that answer that's provided to the world? And that could be manipulated because it's an algorithm, and it's very easy to manipulate and control and blah, blah, blah. So we go down a very dark, deep rabbit hole very fast. So. Don't be obsessed with ChatGPT. I think what it does is wonderful, but that's not the answer, right? If you're a lawyer, is there one answer? No, right? One lawyer says this, another lawyer says this. You know, it's the most interesting intellectual game. So ChatGPT, interesting, but that's not where we're going. It's interesting. That's about it, because life doesn't work that way, right? So. 
I was trying yeah. not to be too dark. No, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, um, I was I was thinking about uh, in Serbia we have a case where we are using a pilot for um, uh, use machine learning for bringing the decisions. Um, I mean, to support judges' decision on traffic misdemeanors. Yeah. So and and it proved to have like ninety seven percent accuracy. So what the a, a machine learning said, judges confirmed in ninety seven percent. But we stop them because judges don't want to have this kind of support. And they are thinking the same way we are talking here, uh, like AI isotopes. <laughs> it's kind of AI is radioactive. It might be, but there are a lot of positive cases. So um, AI can automate tasks, can improve decision making process, Absolutely. can optimize operations. Absolutely. So uh, it's reducing cost, improving service delivery, and enhancing the positive performance of the government. So have you, do you have any uh, like really positive, positive cases of, of, of usage of AI in the government? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, positive use of AI in the government. Yeah, well, there are probably, oh. there are thousands in terms of time savings, cost savings. Yeah. And looking at analytics and projects, um, there's uh, in increasing or decreasing traffic signals so that traffic can go by. There's, there's all that. Um, so the obvious answer is, yeah, of course. Where, where, where I'm concerned is that we talk about AI as if it's um, just one thing. AI, there is not just one AI. You know, AI, AI is, is, is like a child. Your AI is very different than my AI. Whatever she feeds her child, so for breakfast, if you feed your child, I'll, I'll be nice to you. For breakfast, you give your child carrots and apples and things like that. Your child's gonna grow up to be a wonderful child, yes? Yes. I'm scared of what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I feed my child cakes and brownies and ice cream and stuff like that for breakfast. What type of child am I gonna have? A hyperactive one. A hyperactive, right. <laughs> and, and that's the way you have to see AI. Everyone, every government that has an AI, the data you feed it, the training that you do to it, you will raise your own child and it will be unique to you. So just be very careful when we use this general statement about AI. There is no one AI. Everyone's or every government's AI will be unique to that government because that government will train it, feed it, warp it, massage it, you know, raise it, take it to the pool or whatever. And so just be very careful of that. And so some governments, and I'm sure yours will do very well because I love the way you head, where your head is, will raise a beautiful AI that will be healthy and fantastic, where mine will probably you know, ruin the world or something like that. Going back to you and your um, human intelligence in the Asan centers versus the artificial intelligence we have all around the world. Um, I was there a few months ago, walking around the Asan Center. It was um, in the late in the evening. Everybody was working. They're very polite. It looks like, a, if I may say it, it's modern design with immaculate attention to details. Look like a high-end bank in London, for example. And you have um, also a cafe. You have also a playground for kids. But the thing that impressed me the most was um, a space, a place where you have uh, your employees with uh, startups, with citizens working together on designing services. My question is, I I'm not going to ask, um, is it important for your government, this co-creation and collaboration and working to together, but why is it important for your government? Thank you. Uh, I think today uh, the governments need uh, uh, the relationship with the, this, as you say, uh, the uh, private sector, uh, need uh, to collaborate with uh, private sector. Why? Because uh, uh, you see uh, today uh, uh, the data is the most power for, for government, for companies for everybody. And I, I can uh, call our era 
uh, new era, uh, maybe the dataism. You know, in history, uh, federalism, socialism, capitalism, now we are transforming from capitalism to dataism. Why? Because data is a key role, the key tool which uh, the government, uh, if uh, correctly use the data, uh, the government <coughs> can implement the, its uh, strategies very successfully. Uh, but uh, the tools uh, as the, the AI, machine learning, blockchain technology, and etc., uh, they are tools for uh, data-driven uh, uh, decision making. Uh, and uh, now uh, we know the uh, private sector companies, uh, they are very successfully uh, uh, applied and developed, developed and uh, applied uh, high technologies and innovations than governments. That's why uh, I think uh, all governments and our government and we, uh, we need to uh, collaborate with uh, uh, actors in this sphere, in the innovation sphere, as uh, startups, as uh, tech uh, companies, and uh, etc. Thank you so much. Um, so entrepreneurs are very important for for the government. Can, can I provide some another story? Yeah, please do. Please do. Okay. Please do. So here we go. So. <laughs> Many years ago, I was working at IBM, and as we were creating IBM's Watson with AI and everything, um, we, we struggled with one important thing. Does everybody remember the first time they fell in love? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? The, the first time your heart went like that, right? And so I told a bunch of engineers, I told them, close your eyes, and they, 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 they reluctantly closed their eyes. I said, remember that moment? They all got excited. I said, great, open your eyes, now program that. <laughs> program that moment that when you started sweating and your heart, your stomach turned, and your toes went like this, and that's the person, no matter what, you're gonna change your life, you have to be with that person. Program that into an algorithm, it's impossible. So what we understand is that AI lacks that human emotion, it lacks the empathy, it lacks the love. How do you program when two people look into their eye and that magic happens in that moment? Anybody knows how to do that, <laughs> right? So understand that AI is wonderful. It gives wonderful answers and things like that, but it does lack that human part. And that part is sometimes AI will give you a definitive answer is right. But if you understand that person's situation, you may know that the right answer is, you know what? No, because of your situation, the decision is this. Though it is technically right, the AI has checked all the information. It is, that's the right thing to do. But because I'm human and I have a heart, the right thing to do is this. So I know I'm a technologist, but I need everybody to just understand, don't fall in love with technology, right? Yeah, but we're, we're human beings. And that part, we haven't been able to program. We, we can't program those feelings you have. And the other one is, I always said, but people usually laugh at me, but I'll throw it out there anyway, because it's the end of the day, everybody needs to go laugh. Does everybody remember the first time you ever gave uh, someone a kiss? Program that. I, all the engineers in the world don't know how to program that emotion, that feeling. What makes somebody think that way? What makes a human being do those impulses? We don't know how to program that. And until we know how to program that, an AI is still a technology and a machine. And so it is an advisor to you, and you as a human being, you then take the advice and you make the human being decision. Sorry. Well, still we're trying to go to some impossible heights, and uh, uh, some of the greatest entrepreneurs of today, uh, they have entered this billion uh, space race. The final thought about entrepreneurs and space and where are we going? Uh, I mean, uh, we, we said that we are going to start from value-driven organization, but where are we going now? <laughs> well, Nen, I think it's a really important question because we're all going to space, even if we're not physically, and I hope I don't because it sounds dreadful, but the, the, even if we don't physically leave the planet, pretty much all of our critical international infrastructure now lives in low Earth orbit, whether that's connectivity, whether that's Earth observation satellites. You know, there's no stock market, there's no insurance market, there's no find your iPhone, there's no find anything without space. 
And so these entrepreneurs, yes, they might be using it as a billionaire's playground. You know, there might be all kinds of other motivations. But at the end of the day, so much of what we rely on every single day uh, takes place off Earth. And I think we forget that. And I think governments also forget that companies rely on that tremendously, as do governments. Government departments who don't realize that they rely on space services so much are also, uh, I think, uh, forgetting that sometimes. I think we all need to think much more carefully about just how connected our economy here on Earth is to that in space. And of course, people like Bezos and Musk recognize that, not just as an entrepreneurial opportunity, but actually that's the infrastructure, not just of the future belt today. So thank you, thank you very much. We have been advised that we have to finish this. Um, you have been amazing. Ditto. I hope you like our discussion. We can go on and on and on, but the time is uh, short for us. If you want to hear more about the government services, join us on, on Wednesday. There will be a full day dedicated to government services. Thank you so much. Thank you.